Welcome to Personal Landscapes. I'm your host, Brian Murdoch. You can find links for today's episode and other conversations on books about place at ryanmurdoch.com. If you think the age of colonialism ended after the Second World War, today's episode might surprise you. There are still 56 colonies independent territories in the world today, or 61 depending on how you count them. Some are just uninhabited hunks of rock, but many are home to thriving communities with strong ties to their parent country. There was a time when I thought about traveling to these places just to see what life was like there, but a visit to my favorite English-language bookstore in Tokyo told me someone had already done it. Simon Winchester's book Outposts was published in 1985, but as you'll hear in our conversation, getting to the UK's last remaining dependencies took years, incredible perseverance, and a great deal of creativity. This is one of the five or six books I had in mind when I started the Personal Landscapes podcast. It left a lasting impression on me, and it remains one of my favorite books about place. I hope you enjoy it. I'm not sure where I first learned the world still contains something like um, 56 colonies and dependent territories. But I remember when the first one came on my radar, I was in the sixth grade and staring at this big world map on the wall of our classroom when I noticed a, a strange little blip on the map next to Newfoundland with France in brackets. But no one ever explained this to us or taught us about it in school. So where were you when you first learned about this sort of odd geographical legacy of current colonies and territories? Well, I think I knew about Saint Pierre and Miquelon, which is what you're referring to, mm. from when I was whatever sixth grade is in England. I was pretty young, and I thought how bizarre. And yes, I knew about various possessions, mostly French in the Pacific. But as far as the British bits and bobs that were left behind, um, I think I first really became aware of them when. The, there was questions in the House of Commons about a tiny rock in the far South Atlantic, the sub-Antarctic Atlantic, called Thule, I think it was, as in Ultima Thule, which um, someone was shocked to see that the Argentines had placed a flag on. And a lot of um, harumphing went on, people saying, this is disgraceful, it belongs to us. How dare these people put an Argentine bandera on it? And um, we must immediately dispatch a naval force to um, turf the fellows off. And there was just widespread astonishment that the British still had a tiny uninhabited rock in the middle of nowhere, and yet were determined to defend our sovereignty over it and claim it as our own and add it to a vast list of skerries and atolls and little possessions that were still British. And so that piqued my interest. And um, so off I decided to go in, must have been 85, I think, and try and visit all of them. And um, it was a rollicking journey. And the the possessions remain, with the single exception of, of Hong Kong, which uh, has since gone back to its rightful owners, if one can use that term, the Chinese government. But the other 15 are still British and um, still a charge on the parish, as it were, because I think all of them lose a lot of money and so require the British government to look after them. And as far as one knows, none of the inhabitants seem to want Britain to relinquish its hold on them. So um, in a way, the British are being held hostage by the islanders rather than the other way around. It's a sort of sweet irony. But um, yes, I find it fascinating and charming. And uh, it was a journey that I shall never forget. I remember there was talk about uh, the Turks and Caicos voting to join Canada or something at one point. I, I'd been visiting there at the time and I thought nothing good can come of this. Like you can <laughs> see what the expectations were on each side. The Canadians expected this um, sun, winter vacation paradise to to escape our frozen hell. And the Turks and Caicos people must have expected just, you know, handouts and, and social assistance from from Canada, but nothing, nothing came of it, thankfully. No, I mean, well, what they did benefit in terms of um being looked after by the British was an enormous airfield in, is it Providencialis, I think it's called, um, which was built with, I think, British taxpayers' money. And of course, 
No one talked about it until once again there was a question in the House of Commons, how dare we spend so much money just to allow American tourists to come and, and Canadian tourists apparently, to come and bask on the sands of um, Turks and, or, or Grand Turk. Um, the Caribbean islands that the British still run are not run with great, um, what's the word? Well, respectability, I suppose. Most notably, of course, the Cayman Islands, which are uh, ineluctably British and have been so for a very long time, but are home to a, a lot of very suspect money. And um, you just go to the capital, which I assume is called Georgetown, nearly always is, got a name like Georgetown, and you see these walls filled with little brass plates, which are the indicating the home bases of very large companies, which are there to avoid taxation. And a, a lot of grubby money passes through the Caymans with the sort of benign superintendents of the colonial government. Um, and of course, we've also had the tragedy of um, uh, the island that um, uh, has been decimated by a volcano, Montserrat, um, which was an absolutely adorable little island, which has a, a shamrock on its um, coat of arms because it was initially colonized, if colonized be the word, by the Irish. Uh, but that was devastated by a huge and still burping away volcano. So that's not the prettiest of places. But um, then there's Bermuda, of course, which isn't technically in the Caribbean. Interestingly enough, I'm I'm going off to give a talk in um, in London in about two months' time to Trinity House, which is, as you may know, the body which looks after the lighthouses in England and Wales. But until quite recently, it also was technically in charge of the Imperial Lighthouse Service. And I've I sort of like lighthouses. And um, there's a lighthouse in the Caribbean called Sombrero Light, which is still to this day, I think, run by the British. And it's hugely important because it marks a, a major navigation point for vessels, westbound vessels going across the Atlantic and hoping to um, get into the mouth of the Panama Canal. So Sombrero Light is ours. Also, um, Cape Pembroke Light in the Falkland Islands, very important in the prosecution of that war back in 82. And the light that I in foolishly romantically like to call the light at the end of the empire, which is Waglan Island on the eastern edge of Hong Kong. Now, nothing to do with the British at all, but it still winks away. And um, I think its light is being changed into an LED, meaning it's not going to wink with quite the same reliability as it did when it was looked after by a, an elderly lighthouse keeper. It was one of the last manned lights. I know this is departing from what you really want to talk about. but No, no, no. Actually, I was going to ask you, are there any more manned lighthouses? Uh, the last know? manned lighthouse in England and Wales, I think, turfed its keeper out about five years ago. In Scotland, I've got a feeling they're looked after by what's called the Commissioner of the Northern Lights. And the northernmost is... Uh, a lighthouse on a little scary north of the Shetland Islands with the adorable name of Muckle Flugger. And there is, uh -huh. I believe, well, there's a lighthouse there. And I went to it once and I had to be rowed across in an enormous rowing boat manned by great bearded Scotsmen. And then I'm not very good with heights and going up this um, seaweed covered um, pathway and with, with great granite sets to get to see the keeper. And um, he is normally um, replaced and he gets his food and stuff by helicopter. So there is a helicopter pad. And he and I were standing on the helicopter pad and I said, this is remarkable. Everything to the south of me is British, is it not? I mean, we've got the Shetland Islands and then the Orkneys and then mainland Scotland all the way down to Land's End. And he said, no, he said, I'm afraid you're wrong. Turn around. So I turned around looking north towards the North Pole and you see to see that about half a mile north, and there was a vague hump of land washed by the sea. Um, and he said that is called Outstack, and Outstack is the northernmost piece of British possession um, in what is the United Kingdom. But these places are not unimportant because we count our exclusive economic zones this is true to all countries, from those little outcrops, which is still, quote, ours, unquote. And um, Outstack, 
its existence has given us a few more miles of sea and square miles of sea, fishing grounds, oil exploration, and so forth. Which is why there's a continuing dispute over an island about a couple of hundred miles west of the Outer Hebrides, which is the island of Rockall. And that uh, is a little volcanic nodule in the middle of nowhere. You just rear up on it, and there it is, covered with guano and uh, dangerous if you have to. There's no lighthouse on it. I think there's a radar reflector. Um, and so long as it remains British, which it is to this day, a lot of other people have tried to claim it. And of course, the, the occasional eccentric who lands on it and declares it to be an independent country. Um, but so long as the British have control of it, then that is part of the EEZ, the Exclusive Economic Zone, which is for the British to do with what they will. Um, interestingly enough, to reinforce the idea that um, that Rockall is British, a naval vessel went there some years ago and courageous sailors got managed to climb up to the top, which is no easy job, being pecked at by guillemots and um, slipping on the seaweed and stuff. But they got to the top and affixed a brass plate saying, this is Rockall and it's British and go away if you're a foreigner thinking of taking it. And they went back a few years later and found that someone had come and unscrewed it and taken it away <laughs> as a souvenir. Just some passing sailor or something like this? Oh, no. I think someone who was determined, he read about this in the papers and said that, I'll stop at nothing. <laughs> I want to get a, this as a souvenir. That's a, big, that's a big effort to make. So I, I was saying that... Um, I, I don't remember ever being taught about this in school, these colonies and territories, but I got much more interested in this sort of thing years later as I grew more interested in um, traveling to remote places. And I thought, you know, what a great idea for a book. And then I stumbled across outposts in a bookshop and I learned that somebody had already done this. So you shattered my early writing dream, Simon. Sorry about that. I am so sorry, Ron. If it's okay, I wanted to ask you a question about your early years. Uh, just something I'm randomly curious about. You trained as a geologist. And I see the obvious utility of it in a book like Krakatoa, but does geology inform your work more generally? Like I read somewhere that geologists think in the context of deep time. Well, I think it does because, I mean, I am, I suppose, a historian. That's what my books are mostly about, the past. And um, geology is, of course, history without people. So um, I think it does. I, I slightly skeptical of saying it informs my work that sounds awfully pompous for me to say so but uh, i've written three books which are directly geological krakatoa kindly mentioned and then the map that changed the world which was the story of william smith who made at immense personal cost the first geological map of anywhere which was published in 1815 and um a book on the um published on the centenary of the uh, earthquake which ruined San Francisco in 1906. That came out in 2006. So, um, yes, it does. And I think it still does to an extent. When I, I've just written a book, not the most recent book, but a book about land. And land is, of course, geology. So there's a, quite a bit of geology in that. So, yes, I mean, I, I dedicate the new book, which is about knowledge, nothing to do with specifically with geology, but to my old school geography teacher back in the 1950s in Dorset in southwest England. He was called a chap called Harold Mann, but it was Harold that introduced me when I was a 14 or 15-year-old to the joys of geology. I mean, that may seem an oxymoron to people that just call it rocks for jocks or whatever. But um, I did like geology very much, and he said, why don't you take geology at O-level? And O-level... That is the exam that British school children take when they're 15. Never offered a paper in geology, but nonetheless, the board that does these things wrote up a paper, and I was the only student in the entire country that took it, and it was with all the due formality and only invigilator and a clock and keep quiet and turn over your paper and answer these questions. And um, miraculously, thanks to Harold Mann's tutelage, I actually passed it. So I got more O-levels than I should have done. And that's one of the reasons I think I got into a university and uh, the rest is history or hysteria. The story of how you went from a geology to writing is quite an interesting one. 
it's a slight, well, in a way, a departure from what you're talking about, except that James Morris, the person that is central to the story, was a great chronicler of empire and went to most of the places that were involved in that have been left behind. No, the story is quite simple, really. I um, I was living, being a geologist, not a very good one, in um, western Uganda on the Congo border, living in a tented encampment with just me, a little 21-year-old little Lord Fauntleroy and about 20 Ugandan chaps working for me, which is quite extraordinary. So I lived in a tent, a village called Kai and Jojo. And every month or so, because I was sort of interested in climbing, because I was on a range of very, very big mountains called the Ruanzori, um, I would get mountaineering books. And one of them, quite randomly, I got was in the 1955, I think it was published by Faber, a book called Coronation Everest by a man called James Morris about the successful climbing to the summit of Mount Everest by Lord Hunt, or John Hunt's expedition, which propelled um, Edmund Hillary and Sensing Norgay to the summit in 29th of May, 1953. And it was mainly James's story of managing to get the news of their success back to London in time for it to be published on the main news page of the London Times on the day, the very morning of the Queen's coronation, which is the 2nd of June, 1953. And that I found a wonderfully exciting story. I, I liked the idea of mountain climbing in a remote place, success, triumph, all the rest of it, and the simple mechanics of communication of getting a message, a coded message, sent initially by men with you know, with a literally a cloven stick running down mountainsides, delivering this to that, and then turned to a telegraph office, and then to a British embassy in Kathmandu, and then ultimately to London, and then being printed in the Times, which seemed the stuff of great romance to me. So I wrote to this fellow who I'd never heard of, James Morris, care of his publishers, 3 Queen Square, London, WC, and uh, thought, well, that's the last I'll ever hear of that, basically saying I'm a 21-year-old geologist in Africa. Can I be you? And miraculously, he wrote back and said, if you really think you can write, then quite honestly, you should leave your geological caper in Africa and come back to England to get a job on a local paper and write to me again. He was clearly daring me to, you know, fobbing me off with a dare that he thought that I'd never accept. But I did accept, and I left Africa immediately on the day that I got his letter. And no one, of course, wanted to employ a not very good geologist as a newspaper reporter, but eventually, after about six months, someone did, and that was a paper in Newcastle upon Tyne in the far northeast of England. And I got a job you know, being a typical reporter covering fires and robberies and things like that, and wrote to James again. And he was amazed, I think, that I had actually done it. And so became my mentor, if you like, for many years. And But we never met until 1972, by which time I had sort of climbed up the greasy pole of journalism, joined The Guardian, had gone to Belfast for three years, and was now in Washington, D.C., covering Watergate, if you remember that. And um, so on this particular occasion, Nixon had resigned, Ford had pardoned him, and I decided to go climbing because I still had a, a bit of an interest in it, and went climbing and found to my astonishment that James, who I had never met but now did meet, because it turns out he lived very close to a, a hotel I was staying in in North Wales, had turned into a woman and uh, had become or well, was just about to go and have the surgery to make him a woman. And he it was all a success, and he became she, became Jan Morris. And Jan and I remained in close contact for the rest of her life, and we wrote a book together on British architecture in India. And um, I saw a lot of her over the years. Um, and she died, what, about three years ago. And astonishingly, the woman, she's called Sarah Wheeler, who's writing Jan's biography, um, because she had an exceptionally interesting life, not least changing sex in the middle of it. Um, I showed Sarah the reply from James that I received in my tent in Uganda, saying, yes, of course, come and leave geology and enter journalism. 
And Sarah, being a very assiduous reporter back in London, um, tracked down, to my chagrin and embarrassment, the handwritten letter that I had written James from my tent. Wow. So I'm a 21 year old. It's in the Aberyst with Archives in North Wales. Wow. Written on those airmail forms, you know, that you could only write, do not enclose it, anything in it. And I, I said to Sarah, I said, my God, it must be the most naive piece of juvenilia you've ever seen. She said, oh, it's really rather, rather charming, ah. actually. But evidently persuaded James to write back to me. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm hoping to, that Sarah will come back. She was one of my first guests on the podcast. I'm hoping she'll come back oh, when, when the biography is done and we can do a whole episode on, uh, yeah. on Jan Morris. Do you have a favorite Jan Morris book you'd like to recommend? Um, I like Letters from Hav, H-A-V, which is, I don't know if you know about this I don't know book. That one. It's, well, Letters from Hav is a slender volume. Um, she talks about this peninsula, which sort of juts out into the Levantine Eastern Mediterranean on the southern end of Lebanon, north of what is now Israel. Um, and it's an extraordinary little peninsula, which had been run over the years by the Venetians and the Romans, of course, and the Greeks. And there's architectural evidence of all of these places. And inevitably, of course, it was the French got it for a while. The Dutch had it. Um, and the British had it for a long time until it declared independence. And she was telling me this story because she had come across a trove of letters from various people who lived in Hav. And um, she said, you, 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 you do know the place, don't you? And I said, well, I think I do. I've never been there, gosh, but yes, I'm familiar with it. She slapped me on the knee and said, that this is a complete fictitious place. It doesn't exist. <laughs> Figment of my imagination. So that she pulled a fast one on me, and I deserve to look foolish. <laughs> but Letters from Harv is rather charming. Mm. I think if I had to choose one, it would be um, Trieste in the Meaning of Nowhere. Trieste, yeah. Uh, because it's, a, it's about I'm one of these in-between places. Yes. Right, exactly. And, and I'm seriously interested in Trieste because um, I'm doing a book on the natural history of the wind. Mm. And Trieste, of course, has this infamous wind called the Bora. And I want to experience it. I have to ask Triestonians or whatever they're called, which is the month in which I'm most likely to experience Bora and then head off there and get buffeted. You have to be chained to a pole, apparently. I'm chained to a pole, exactly. Yes. Well, so winds come up quite an awful lot in, in outposts as well. So let's talk about the logistics of outposts. You managed to reach some remarkably difficult places. You wrote what I had hoped might occupy six months, in fact, took three years. For 40,000 miles, read 100,000, and my fond belief that it might be possible to include all the remains of the empire in one eccentric circumnavigation turned out to be the most wishful of thinking. So six months is pretty optimistic. So why, why was this so difficult, this journey? Well, because one, there's one um, corner of the empire which remains a corner of the empire, which you're forbidden to visit. And that's um, the island of Diego Garcia in uh, the middle of the Indian Ocean, about 1,500 miles east of Mauritius. That took a lot of getting to. And um, Pitcairn Island in the middle of the Pacific, really, really remote, no airstrip, no nothing. So that took a lot of getting to. The Diego Garcia story is quite interesting because um, I... I knew the story very vaguely that this archipelago called BIOT, British Indian Ocean Territory, um, had a hardly a thriving population, but it had a a native population of um, they were people ethnically from northern Madagascar. In other words, they were Malagasy people, and they spoke as Creole, and they lived on these islands uh, largely uh, harvesting coconuts um, for you know, fiber and, and milk and so forth. And um, owned by a, I think it was a Mauritian or maybe an social wire company, Agalega company it was called. But anyway, there was in the middle of these islands um, a Royal Air Force airstrip on this little um, atoll quite a big atoll, actually, called Diego Garcia. And it was a coaling station for P&O ships running between Port Said and um, Perth in Australia. They would stop off at um, 
Diego Garcia and pick up coal. Then it was turned into, in the 1960s, into a very big American airstrip um, base. Um, and I knew vaguely that in the deal that was struck between the British and the American governments resulted in the expulsion of some of the local people. And But I equally knew I was forbidden to go there. So I was sort of grumpy. I'd asked permission to go and been re- firmly denied. I was sitting, I remember, one morning in um, Oxford, where I lived at the time, having breakfast. And um, I got a call from a man called Richard Maidley, I think that was his name, who ran something called the Minority Rights Group, which publicized the rights of people who were overlooked or flooded by dams or turfed out of places, you know, people like the indigenous of the Brazilian rainforest, that kind of person. And the MRG, Minority Rights Group, had published a paper on the tragedy, as they saw it, of Diego Garcia, the sort of insolent uh, arrogance of both the British and the American governments. And this had been read by an Australian woman called Ruth Boydell, who lived in um, northern Queensland, and who was wanted to conduct a round-the-world single-handed circumnavigation of the, of the planet on a little yacht which she had bought. And um, when she got to Cochin in India, she decided that she would try and get to Diego Garcia, but she was frightened because it would not be, it was against the law and you, you would get your yacht confiscated and get into all sorts of trouble. So she wanted to go not alone, but with someone. So she got in touch with the Minority Rights Group in London to say, do you know anyone in England that's interested in Diego Garcia? And Richard Maidley said, I do know a chap. He's called Winchester and he lives in, currently I know he's writing this book and he'd love to go. Richard rang me up and said, here are the details. All I know is that she's in the harbour in Cochin in India and her yacht is called the Sketty Bell, which is an unusual word. And um, that's all I can tell you about her. Why not see if you can track her down? She had no mailing address other than care of post offices that she intended to visit around the world. Now, this was the, the beginning of international telephone dialing. You could actually dial foreign numbers, providing you knew the code. And I knew you could dial the country code for India. I think it was 91. And you could dial the major cities, Bombay, Calcutta, Delhi, Madras. But I didn't think you could dial any further than that. But I knew, I'd never been to Cochin, but I knew there was a hotel in Cochin called the Bolgati Palace. And I looked up its telephone number and I found its number and the city code for Cochin. So I thought, well, let's take a chance. Let's dial 001 to get out of England. 91 to get into India, 3392, which was the code for Cochin, and then whatever this long number for the Bolgati Palace was. And I remember vividly sitting in my dressing gown with a cup of coffee, hearing the clicks and clacks, because in those days it wasn't electronic. There were what was called Strauger mechanical telephone exchanges, and you could hear them clicking in the background. And amazingly, it started ringing. Uh, this weird, because the Indian telephone service still has the double ring, 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 that's sort of British, whereas, of course, in North America, and in, uh, it's a single ring. And uh, someone picked it up, a chat with an Indian accent, hello. And I said, hello, I'm calling from England. Um, is that the Bolgati Palace Hotel? And he said, yes, in was certain years. I said, well, this is amazing. I didn't think I'd get through to you, but I'll tell you what. I'm trying to locate an Australian woman who has a yacht which you might be able to see in the harbour down below you. And he said, oh, you mean Miss Ruth? I said, you know her? (laughs) Yes. He said, not only do I know her, but she's I'm the bartender here, and she's sitting in the bar opposite me. Ruth, there's a call for you from England. (laughs) And this woman got on the line, hello? And I said, you don't know me, but... My name's Simon Winchester, and I'm calling you from Oxford in England, and I want to go to Diego Garcia. And she said, 
my word. He said, all my prayers are answered. Have you ever sailed before? And I said, no. She said, well, you come here. I'll teach you how to. <laughs> and so I flew over to Cochin, and there was this woman, and we sailed to Diego Garcia. We went through the Maldives, and she taught me how to sail, and more importantly, taught me how to navigate using celestial navigation. And we made it to Diego Garcia and got into frightful trouble. And um, we're eventually deported because there was this classic moment. We what had happened? I mean, I don't want to overburden you with the story, but we were we had stopped in one of the outer islands of the archipelago, a place called Salomon Island, and stayed there for a week or so. Well, yes. Yeah, so stop there for a sec. Yeah, that island seems to be kind of visitors are sort of tolerated there. It seems like it's become a bit of a place for the yacht crowd. Like I've seen recent photos. Um, with signs on bottom island saying you're laying out rules for fire pits and anchorages. So what did you see there? You described an abandoned settlement. It was an abandoned settlement. You could see, see old sort of French colonial. It was weird considering it was a British outpost, but there were architecture was clearly British. Um, old must have been the plantation manager's house. And there were huts and so forth. And I remember going into, if you can imagine, overgrown, tropical, this had been a coconut plantation. Um, going into the manager's house, which was all fallen, it was very dangerous to go in there for a start. But I remember finding a copy of Pushkin, a book by Pushkin, whether it was poems, I can't remember. And at the moment I was sitting outside looking at it, being astonished, an American C-130 Hercules aircraft flew over very low altitude. And I realized that that had come from Diego Garcia, which was about 100 miles south of us, clearly doing a patrol, seeing if any interlocus, because this was a secret place, had stopped by. And indeed, I can imagine him taking photographs and saying, woman and man and yacht, seen in the lagoon at Bodam Island, which was the name of the island. So they were well aware that they might have thought we were part of the yachty crowd, but and didn't know what our actual mission was, which was to get specifically to Diego Garcia itself. Anyway, we stayed there about a week and then made the passage down to Diego Garcia and located it mainly. Um, we had no navigation equipment apart from the sextant, um, using a direction finding aerial tuned into Voice of America, or rather American Forces Network, broadcasting to the troops on Diego Garcia, on what they call the footprint of freedom. Because if you look at an aerial photograph of Diego Garcia, the atoll looks like a child's foot, a little heel at the south and the toes up the north. So we it was a Sunday morning, I remember, when we Diego Garcia was available. We could see it. And um, a huge Ocean going tug called the something W, I think you seem to remember, based in Seattle, was out there in the ocean. We hove to and came up next to it. And they were fishing from the stern, about 20 or 30 sailors. And we spoke to each other and, Where are you going? And we said, Diego Garcia. And the skipper said, Oh, no, you're not. And um, because it's forbidden, we're from Diego Garcia. We're just taking a spin to have a, give the boys some fishing time. And we're determined to go. So Ruth said, well, I tell you what, we'll throw all our water overboard and we've got a leaking stern gland anyway to the little engine we had. So we'll declare an emergency and um, seek to go into, to seek under the, I think it was the Warsaw Convention, go into the port as a port of refuge. And the captain of the of the, little, of the tug said, well, okay, I guess that is a ruse that'll probably work. So we reefed our sails and chugged in through the entrance to the reef and um, dropped anchor. And um, sure enough, a little pilot boat came out to us and there was a pompous little English customs official who said, oh, hello, um, well, Ruth said, oh, I'm claiming port of refuge. And he said, um, well, do you, are you carrying any firearms? And, and then said, what's your purpose? And she said, I told you, I'm going to do some repairs and get some water. 
And he said, what's your, let's see your passports. And so Ruth gave her Australian passport and I gave my British passport. And he said, uh, to me, uh, what is your profession? And my passport in those days, when you had to put your profession on your passport, uh, simply said representative. It's one of those anodyne words, which means nothing. I was told subsequently the best word to put on is farmer, because everyone likes farmers. But what you don't put is businessman or spy or something like that. And he said, representative of what? And I said, um, publishing, actually. And he said, publishing newspapers by any chance? And I said, possibly, why do you ask that? He said, because. And he reached into his briefcase and pulled out all the faxes that I had sent from London to the Foreign Office months before requesting permission. And he got on his high horse and he said, you, Mr. Winchester, have been forbidden <laughs> from ever coming here, but you have persuaded this innocent Australian sailor to bring you here, doubtless against her will, and you must leave immediately. And Ruth said, no, I'm not leaving. And um, you can't compel us to leave. He said, okay, 48 hours, no more. So there we were, 48 hours, and um, we couldn't go on shore, except about 12 hours later, a little boat came up full of American sailors, and they were from the USS Corpus Christi, which was a nuclear submarine, which was in the, in the lagoon. They said, here you guys had a bit of problem with the British authorities. Come and let us give you a tour. Wow. So they gave us a tour. And uh, not of the submarine, regrettably, but of the landscape of um, of Diego Garcia. So we got on on, on shore, and uh, everything was fine. But then they got really nasty, and London insisted we move. And so they said, "If you don't get out, we're going to confiscate your yacht, and we're going to send you on an aircraft back to London, and you'll just have to whistle to get your boat back." So Ruth said, "Okay, fair deal." So we pulled up the anchor. And we went out. I mean, good Lord, we're a tiny little 30-foot schooner. We could do maybe three knots. And we were followed, if followed be the word, by a Royal Navy frigate, which accompanied us for about 20 miles to make sure that we got really clear of uh, And then they said goodbye to us, and uh, mm -hmm. off we sailed. So it's interesting that this comes up years later in your work as well. You, you said that the deal signed between Britain and the US for this 50-year lease was supposed to be uh, without payment. But wasn't it you that found out what the price actually was, that it was a discount on some missiles? Yes, it, it, it was indeed. It was um, a £14 million discount on the price of Trident missiles for our nuclear strategic submarine fleet. So we paid £14 million for it, um, for the lease which is presumably going to be coming up fairly soon. And, of course, a lot has happened in the years since, the, largely due to a report from the Washington Post, and I have to say also from me, there's been a quite a movement to what happened. I'm sorry, I should back up a bit. When the deal was struck, the, um, the islanders were rounded up during the night. All their pets were incinerated, which struck me as particularly macabre part of the story. But the civilians were herded onto a ship and taken to Mauritius, where they were unceremoniously dumped on the dockside in the capital of Mauritius and left there to rot. And um, they were technically stateless because their state no longer really existed. I mean, notionally, I suppose they were British colonial subjects, but they weren't subjects. They weren't citizens of Mauritius, which by then was an independent country. And Due to their efforts and a lot of publicity from various newspapers and then later television companies, they started to get a voice and they started to campaign for their rights to go back, not least to um, go and tend the graves of their ancestors and things. But the British and American governments initially were adamant and said there will be no access. But then the United Nations got on side and uh, they have this uh, colonial decolonizing uh, Sort of committee, which insists that situations like this should be remedied for the benefit of the local people. 
And so they are technically being allowed back. And occasionally, they're not going to Diego Garcia, as far as I know, but they are going to places like Bodham, where we had been. And sooner or later, later rather than sooner, because the Americans are very powerful, I suspect they will regain control. Mauritius probably will regain control of the islands. And um, some sort of sense will be brought back to the rather tragic situation. But Diego Garcia is so important to the American military effort, nearly all what it's full of, the lagoon is full of prepositioned ships with full of tanks and landing crafts and, of course, tons and tons of weaponry uh, for when the balloon goes up as it keeps on going up in the Middle East. So whenever you see cargo planes and jet fighters and, indeed, strategic bombers over places like um, Afghanistan, when you did, and when you see things like the killing of uh, Osama bin Laden in um, Abbottabad in western Pakistan, the troops doing that would inevitably come via Diego Garcia. So the Americans are not going to give that up without a struggle. Notionally, it's still British. The Americans effectively control it. I just saw a story about it this morning, funny enough, in um, their Spiegel's English site. Yeah. It was about the, the people trying to, to get back to, um, to these islands. That there's something to do with an... Uh, a court case, an international human rights case that they had won. And so progress seems to be made, but everybody seemed very skeptical that anything would be done to, at least before the, the people who originally were expelled from this place die. I'm afraid that's they, the, they must be quite old by now. They are getting quite old, like me. So we're all getting old. But the city that people should not, I mean, it was a monstrous injustice. Mm. And also it, it's a disgusting place full of horrible weapons. And they should be taken away. This is a pristine, beautiful part of the Indian Ocean, full of wonderful wildlife and fish, and leaving aside the people. Um, and now it's just, a, you know, it looks like the worst of New Jersey. Another um, place I would like to ask you about is Tristan da Cunha. That's another outpost that was extremely difficult to reach. Uh, where is it for those who don't know, and why is that interesting? It's in the South Atlantic Ocean. It's 1,800 miles west of Cape Town. And um, administratively, it um, is part of uh, a trinity of islands or groups of islands um, administered from another British island called St. Helena, which is sort of in the armpit of Africa, if you like, also in the Atlantic Ocean, um, where there's a governor who lives in Waterloo House, where there's, oddly enough, that St. Helena was where Napoleon was exiled after his defeat at Waterloo, and um, where indeed he died. And uh, the house in which he was li living, and indeed the declivity where he was initially buried, he's now buried back in Paris, where he was dug up and buried again, um, that is hallowed French territory to this day. And there is an honorary French consul who lives in the house is called Longview House, and uh, he sort of gives tours. And I think the same consul has been there for about 40 years. And there's a British governor who um, presides over an absolutely idyllic little town, or Jamestown. All the architecture is three or 400 years old. It's beautiful. It was an East India Company outpost. And it has these two sub-outposts, if I could put it like that, Ascension Island, which is to the north of St. Helena, about 800 miles to the north. And that's basically, it's, it's a volcano um, with no native population, but um, has lots of technical stuff. There's a big airbase there, British airbase. Um, and there's um, BBC World Service transmitters. Although they're not called transmitters, they're called senders, oddly enough, eccentrically. And there's a GCHQ NSA spy base listening to chatter from West Africa. But to the south of St. Helena, and nonetheless administered by it, is Tristan de Cunha, which is also a volcano. And it's a volcano which erupted back in the 1960s, and the Royal Navy evacuated the entire population, which is about 250 people, and brought them back to England. And they lived in an army barracks in a uh, place called Leon Solent near um, Southampton in southern England. And they hated it and couldn't wait to go back home. And eventually, after six months or so, um, having seen their first motor car and been in their first lift and the first shop, all these things, 
because they have nothing down in uh, the little town, the little settlement of Edinburgh of the Seven Seas, which is the capital of, of uh, Tristan. They went back there. Not all of them did. A few stayed, um, but most of them went back. And there are only seven family names, um, and there's a lot of interbreeding, and that means that uh, there's a lot of uh, diseases which are particularly endemic in among inbred communities, most notably retinitis pigmentosa, but they also get a lot of asthma from the sulfur in the volcano, which is puffing away merrily in the middle of them. And they don't do very much. Um, they didn't until recently have television, so they were very much cut off from the cultural life of the rest of the world. But now they've got um, satellite dish and all that sort of stuff, so they are pretty well in touch with the world. Um, they're fairly impoverished. They get all their food supplies from South Africa, but there's a ship which comes south from Cardiff, I think, two or three times a year, calls at Ascension, St. Helena, and then very occasionally in Tristan. And um, it is, you know, there's a big signpost in the middle of the little settlement called Trist Welcome to Tristan to Kuna, the most remote island in the world, which it probably is most remote inhabited island of any significant size. Um, and yes, I have this weird distinction of, of being prohibited from it because they didn't like what I wrote about it. So it's a long story and I won't bore you with it, but it's, um, um, when I go, my wife and I have been there twice, I think, and she's allowed on, but I'm not. So I just sit there mutely looking at the place, thinking how unfair life can be. You initially tried to get there by sailing as well, right? But that, that proved to be impossible. Why is this such a difficult journey? Well, it's a very difficult journey because the waters down there are very cold. And we were sailing out of Cape Town. And we didn't really get much further than Robin Island, where Mandela was imprisoned, because the waters were so cold and so very rough. And the the sailing, uh, there's this South Atlantic gyre, which means you have to do a lot of jibing and sailing in complicated waters. It would have taken a very long time, so much easier to go around and shoot straight up to the Caribbean. and um, Or St. Helena, you can stop at St. Helena, because that's uh, navigationally quite easy to get to. But Tristan is very difficult. Plus, you have these enormous waves, uh, breakers, and, and to get into the harbour is quite a performance to this day. You have to sort of know Salem, where his salt would, if he gets to Tristan, would actually try and get into the harbour because there are two piers and um, you essentially surf in on incoming swells, uh, which... I would never have been competent, and I think Ruth wouldn't have been either. And so the what happens is a passing cargo ship will will heave to and anchor itself to the bait beds of kelp, which surround the islands, very, very tough seaweed, and wait for an island boat to come. And then it, if you're permitted to land, well, you'll get in the island boat and you'll allow it to surf in over these monstrous incoming west driven by the westerly winds into the uh, harbour and then go into the settlement. So you eventually made it there on the, the Royal Mail ship, the St. Helena, and you talked about how everything changed at the 30th parallel, like previously calm seas and sunny skies just switched to sudden squalls. And your description of the seas that you encountered when circling the island to try to find its lee were even more dramatic. It's just The weather seemed to just monstrous in, in, in a heartbeat it was astonishing what i would almost say out of a clear blue sky it's um it's very very capricious and we were, you know, we were a well-found ship um but even the master had great difficulty as you say trying to find the lee um and then getting in it was it was a reminder that as you say south of the 30th parallel once you enter the world of albatrosses and then ultimately of course the roaring 40s and then the furious 50s the winds can be very, very powerful and capricious and unpleasant. So it's not a place I would choose to live, I must say, and those that do are hardy folk indeed. So why on earth would anyone live there in the first place? It's a very good question you'd have to ask. They didn't, once, as I mentioned, when they were evacuated, they really didn't like what you and I would call Western civilization. They preferred their own community, very tight-knit, very hard-working with their own 
they all spoke English, um, but it was a peculiar form of English with odd grammatical, you know, the and thy and thou and words, pronouns like that. And they have bizarre names, Gansies, remember is one, ammunitions, which is a name for socks, which is very peculiar. It take a better man than I to delve into the anthropological eccentricities of these people. But um, they don't seek to leave. I mean, when my wife and I were last there, there was a couple going to South Africa for medical treatment, I think, for their child, but they fully intended to come back. Uh, it's a sort of cosy life in a way. Um, hmm. you know, their houses are substantial. They're made of stone because there's lots of lava lying around. And um, it's generally healthy apart from these herit- heritable illnesses. I can I can sort of see the attraction. Um, but on the other hand, they're not all great boatmen because the sailing conditions are very difficult. St. Helena, by contrast, is a... Well, there, there's this tragic story, which is... I've actually forgotten it until you reminded me. St. Helena is almost entirely covered by flax. Formium Tenex, I remember its name. And there were mills which would turn the flax into rope. And indeed, to this day, the breaking strength of rope is still measured against, in the Royal Navy, against that of St. Helena made rope of different thicknesses. So they made rope there, or at least produced the hemp fiber, which was made into rope back in places like Bridport and Portsmouth in England. But they also made string. And generally, the as the Royal Navy shrank, the market for serious rope began to diminish. But the market for string remained vibrant because the British Post Office bought a lot of string. They had a huge contract. And so the scutching mills in St. Helena were kept busy in the population, about 900 people, harvesting flax and turning it into string um, was vibrant. It was a prosperous economy. And then one anonymous civil servant sitting in London looked at the numbers and said, far too expensive. I think we'll switch tying our parcels. We'll tie them with nylon twine. And so the contract was allowed to lapse. And all of a sudden, there was no market for St. Helena hemp, string, or rope, or anything. So all the factories closed down, and everyone found themselves out of work. And so the British government had to step in and give them aid, which they were affronted by at first. They said, we've never been aided. We were a self-sufficient little overseas territory. But now, when I was last there, it is per capita, certainly as far as the British are concerned, and I think in the world, the recipient per capita of most aid of anywhere, because this population has to be looked after entirely at the expense of the British taxpayer. I think you had said that in Tristan de Kuna, one of the few remaining places was do- that was doing well economically from selling um, crawfish or rock lobster to the Americans. Yes, and, and pretending to the Americans to whom they sold it that this was was lobster tails or claws or whatever they are. And um, they're very good and they're, they're relatively inexpensive. Um, and um, yes, there was quite a, quite a good trade. Not sure whether it's still, um, I think probably their biggest trade is now with South Africa rather than the United States. It seems to attract a, a sort of strange caliber of people. So you talked about on your on your journey on the mail ship, you, um, the passengers included an American called Park Thompson, the world's most traveled man. Places like this seem to attract yes. these sort of travel obsessives. Yes, I was given an award a few years ago by a society in New York called, I think it's the Magellan Society, which is full of such people that want to go everywhere. I think if I remember, Park Thompson had a wife who was called Babette. <laughs> and he, my beautiful wife, Babette, he kept introducing. She was a sturdy lady, if I remember. Um, and they claim to have been everywhere. That's right. They belong to something called the Century Club mm-hmm. in Los Angeles, which sought to go to every country in the world, believing that to be 100 countries. In fact, there were a great deal more than that. And um, they went everywhere, but it 
a lot of it was cheating, putting your foot over a line in North Korea and saying you've been in North Korea. So, um, you know, there was like twitchers, these people who obsessively must see a bird. They'll go to enormous lengths so they can tick it off. Well, you've got a great description of, of a, a bird watcher, an American bird watcher on the boat. You say, I had offered him milk in his coffee, and he replied with stern gravity that, no, I never take lactates. I have grave internal problems. <laughs> and you chose it's not right, to pursue I the discussion it. any further. <laughs> right. yes. Grave internal problems. So sorry. <laughs> well, that's very American. Uh, well, I'm so, an American. Don't be rude. <laughs> hey, it's a, it's a border issue. I'm sorry. I, I grew up on the border looking across at, uh, at America. Where, where, West Coast, East Coast, where were you from? St. Lawrence River. Right. So right around the Thousand Islands. Thousand Islands, right. Yeah. So one, one more place I have to ask you about, um, Ascension Island. You, brought, you mentioned this earlier. You described this as both the most lovely and the most strange of all the forgotten corners of empire. So what was, what was lovely about it and what was strange? Well, initially it doesn't appear ugly because it is, as someone described it, hell with the fire put out. It was just a volcano with no vegetation on it at all. But then in the, I think the latter part of the 19th century, maybe the 20th century, someone decided that you could actually attract vegetation by, well, what you need is rain. There was effectively no rain because the warm, wet, westerly winds would sail right over it without being caught by anything and proceed on their merry way to Africa. So they planted some trees at the very top that brought in some soil from England, I think. Um, and this resulted in the moisture being caught and rain started to fall on the summit. And eventually it built up into a little rainforest, which sort of spread down the flanks of the mountains, hmm. sufficiently for there to be grass and ultimately cattle. So someone bought some cows there. And um, I remember the... Um, the place was run in those days effectively by the BBC. And the BBC gives initials to every person who works there. Their job is, for instance, Enka. I remember it, Editor News and Current Affairs. So who is Enka? Enka is Mr. Smith. The man who ran the farm on the summit of Ascension Island that provided milk for the people that were unfortunate enough to live there was named MacDonald, and his initials were E-I-E-I-O. That's he was genius. Electrical Instrumentation oh. and Energy, something, something, officer. <laughs> so Mr. MacDonald had a farm on the Section Island. But I stayed there once. I had a bizarre experience. I was going, heading north from the Antarctic on a little Russian freighter. It was going so slowly. And this was after the Falklands War when there was a regular flight from Bryce Norton in Oxfordshire, RAF, to the Falklands, which touched down to refuel on Ascension Island. And um, I figured if I pulled a few strings, rather than lumbering northwards on this Russian ship, which passed within a few miles of Ascension, I could ask, persuade him to let me um, land on Ascension and catch a ride back to England on the RAF. And they said yes. And so I found myself on Ascension, um, waiting for this plane, which was due to come in three or four days' time. And the local vicar, there is a vicar who lives in the old leprosy hospital, because it used to be a place for putting lepers. And so I stayed there with him. He was Timothy, I think his name was, and Angela. And they were really sweet and nice. The northbound plane came down from London, and um, that, it was going to go on to Port Stanley. And the Falklands turned around and come back. So it would be about 36 hours more. And the vicar was very pleased. And he said, Simon, this is your last night on the island, so I want to show you something special. So we had dinner with him. And that was the night I was going back at about three in the morning, I think. And he said, well, we managed to get a little surprise from the southbound plane. And we've got some strawberries and cream from England. It's wonderful. So let's go and find the only white sand beach on Ascension. All the beaches are black volcanic sand. But there was, for some peculiar geological reason, there's a white sand beach. And so we um, 
went to it. And if you can imagine the pitch dark, there was no moon, and the sky was deeply velvety black. Lying, no, 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 I'm sorry, I've got it wrong. There was a moon, there was a full moon. And so the white sand was brilliantly white. We laid out a tablecloth in this little dark cove. And there we had white wine and strawberries and cream from England, courtesy of the southbound aircraft. And it must have been about 10, 9, 10 o'clock at night. And he said, the surprise for you ought to start about now. And sure enough, out of the surf, you could see lumbering figures looking at, like invading troops coming towards us. And we realized as they passed us, they were turtles, wow. scores and scores of turtles, which had come all the way from Brazil. And they ranged themselves behind us, turned around, scooped with their rear flippers, holes in the sand, and then laid clutches of eggs. And then, bless their hearts, strolled back into the water without a care for their young ones and began the long 2,000 miles swim back to Brazil. I thought that was pretty amazing. Then as we were sort of chatting about this extraordinary phenomenon, suddenly it started to get really cold. And I couldn't work out why until I saw that the moon was going into a total lunar eclipse. And sure enough, everything went pitch dark. That's what I was remembering about the darkness, the velvety darkness. And I thought, this is pretty amazing. But then there were rising out of the eastern sky the brilliant lights, and they were the lights of the Hale Bop comet. Wow. You know, there was a comet, yes, which yes. was not visible because of the moonlight, but became visible because of this um, eclipse. And then the shadow of the Earth receded, and the Earth, the moon, started to look like a bright moon again, and the Hale Bop comet disappeared. And we were all lying on the beach thinking, my God, what a wonderful sort of confection of. The lights when suddenly two more lights appeared in the southern sky. And I thought, that's weird. Is that another comet? And the vicar said, no, that's the lights of your incoming aircraft. Wow, just in time. Just in time. We raced off to the airport, which was about half a mile away, got on the plane and flew back to England. Amazing. So it was, speaking of the Falklands, you were you were there in, in 1982 when war broke out. You said... Uh, I was lying wedged under a bed. The colonial governor's chauffeur had one of his feet in my left ear. A terrified cat was cowering under a pile of pink candle wick, and the sound of gunfire was everywhere. Remar you just turn, seem to turn up in these places when, when everything falls apart. I know. It's from everything was. They asked me not to go to places. Um, yes, that was, that was extraordinary. But my wife and I went back to... Um, the Falklands a few years ago and found Don Bonner, who was the governor's driver, drove the governor's car was a London taxi back in those days. And um, it was extraordinary going back there. It's a very sort of patriotic place now with busts of Margaret Thatcher and memorials, of course, to those both British and Argentine who died. But as Borges said very appositely, I mean, war over the Falkland Islands is like two bald men fighting over a comb. I mean, it completely pointless as having the place. But the islanders do not want to hand it to the Argentines. They like their rather cosy British way of life, rather like the people in, in, in Tristan. So it's, it's, it's peculiar. We haven't talked at all about Pitcairn Island, of course. That's the, the, one, the last place I want to ask you about. So you, yeah. you missed going there for the book, but you, have you been there since? I have been there. I've been there twice, actually. So, and I think I put it into a later preface or an addendum somehow. There's a weird story about Pitcairn, which you probably know, but it's worth telling that hmm. the there's a population of about 50. And they're all essentially, unlike the Tristanians who have been, as it were, infected by newcomers, some Italians, Repetto and Lavarello, added to the other five names, the Blasses and the Swains, the Rogerses, who they, were the five names that lived there, the five families that lived there. Almost all of the people are descendants of the mutineers from the um, HMS Bounty in 1789, 
year of the French Revolution, but the year when Pitcairn was settled. So basically, after the mutiny, Fletcher Christian and his chums went to Tahiti, scooped up a number of ladies who they thought were of breeding age. I mean, this is the way that empire worked, of course, and brought them down to uh, Pitcairn and had a number of babies. And uh, bingo, that was the beginning of a, a proper colony. And um, about 30 years ago, I suppose it was now, uh, I think the West Sussex police force had some spare money and knew that Pitcairn didn't have a police force, didn't have anything really, didn't have a governor. And so they said to a young woman on the force, why not go down, there's a passing cargo ship and you can get off, go and have a shift, go and have a look at uh, at Pitcairn and see if they need any policing. And she got down there, it took a long time to get there, but she found to her horror that um, it was perfectly customary for um, the Pitcairn men to begin having relationships with girls as young as 10, 11, or 12 years old. It was the custom. Everybody did it, which she thought this was not on. And so when she got back to England, she reported it and said um, the full might of British justice was brought to bear. And the men who were sleeping with these youngsters were identified and arrested. A force went down there. They were put into custody or taken away, actually, to New Zealand initially. And um, it was decided to try them. And this involved millions of pounds being spent building a courthouse, having lawyers flown in from London, both to prosecute and to defend these people, and evidence taken and policemen. I mean, the, the mechanics of the British judicial system landing on this tiny outcrop in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It was a bizarre thing to behold. And eventually they were, I think six of them, found guilty. But they had no prison. So they had to go to Ikea, which apparently makes a prison in a box. And so it was shipped over to Pitcairn and erected by the men who were then going to be incarcerated in it. Because otherwise they would have had to have been put in prison in New Zealand, um, which was four and a half thousand miles away. That's where the technically the governor lived. He administered Pitcairn from New Zealand. So these men were put in prison, and then the realization dawned on the islanders that these were the men who manned the longboats that met the cargo ships that occasionally passed by and who ferried the beer and the toilet paper and whatever the ship was bringing that was essential to Pitcairn life. And so if they were in prison and were, done, were unable to man the longboats, then Pitcairn could get no inbound cargo and would die. So it was decided that every time a ship appeared on the horizon, a bell would be rung, and the men would be released from the prison for the day or the day, and row the longboat and get the cargo, and the colony would be saved. So the men all underwent their sentences, they served them out, and by the time they were released, there were no women of um, sufficient age to bear children left on the island. And so the island is now dying, decaying, um, dying, dying. And so they're looking for people to come and settle. It's an idyllic place. I mean, let this be an advertisement for anyone that wishes to have a very, very isolated life in the middle of the Pacific island. Um, there are four islands in the, the Pitcairn group called Henderson, Ducey, and Oino. And Henderson Island, which is about 60 miles away from the main Pitcairn Island, is sufficiently flat for there to be an airstrip built. And the thought is that maybe, maybe there could be an airstrip, and then a ferry could take people who wanted to leave Pitcairn or come into Pitcairn as tourists, could be shuttled to and from the airstrip. So there is a possibility for a plan for revivifying it, but I doubt, frankly, it will. And nearly all the older Pitcairn Islanders 
have actually gone to Norfolk Island, which is an island off the Queensland coast, which takes, it's a very idyllic place, a former prison colony um, with lots of lovely old buildings and beautiful, beautiful weather. And ironically, it, the biggest per capita commerce there is done in Lego. There's a huge Lego shop there. And because the majority of visitors, either from Australia or New Zealand, are elderly grandparents, the Lego company from Denmark has said, you want to take a souvenir of Norfolk Island back? Buy Lego. And they do huge quantities. So Lego sold to them by a Pitcairn exile who has moved from a dying colony to Norfolk Island is a rare commodity indeed. Didn't somebody attempt to settle Anderson Island? I saw something about this. He did. He was called Smiley Radcliffe, and he came from Frogland, Virginia. Smiley Radcliffe, Virginia. yes, yes, yeah, yeah. He made a great deal of money from coal mining and built himself an enormous castle in Frog Level, which I've been to. And he said that he wanted, he didn't like Jews, and he didn't like black people. He wanted white, like-minded West Virginians with amply bosomed West Virginia women to go and create a settlement somewhere in the world where they would breed and create paradise. And he happened upon a description of Henderson Island and wrote to the British government saying, I would like to buy Henderson Island. And I want to settle there. It is uninhabited. And the British government put on its haughtiest manner and said, Her Majesty's government does not sell parts of the empire to foreigners, certainly not people like you. And he harumphed a bit and said, well, if I build at my expense an airfield there and give you my expense a ferry boat, then everyone will be happy because um, the Pitcairn Islanders will then be able to go off to London or France or Bermuda or wherever they want to go. And briefly, the Foreign Office said, well, actually, that's not a bad idea. Maybe we can come to some arrangement. But then the World Wildlife Fund got into the act and discovered a fruit-eating pigeon and a flightless rail that lived on Henderson Island and said these two animals would be at risk if an airport were built there. And the whole matter died, as indeed did Smiley Radcliffe. Hmm. So were you ever tempted to extend your travels to other colonies and territories, or was the interest for you solely British? Well, I was, because I wanted to go to some of these French colonies, in most notably in the Pacific, which brings us, of course, full circle back to Saint-Pierre Miquelon, the only place in North America which uses the euro, and indeed the last place in North America to employ the guillotine as a form of execution. There's a charming film about it. I wanted to go to these strange places, Wallace and Fortuna, for instance, which are a couple of French islands in the middle of the Pacific, yeah. mainly because to demonstrate to knuckle-headed English people that France manages its rump of empire rather better than we do, because all of these French territories are France and send representatives to the parliament in Paris, giving, therefore, the residents of places like you know, the Friendly Islands and the Society Islands, the French Islands in the Pacific, and places like Martinique and Guadeloupe and the Caribbean, just the same rights as people who live in Perpignan and Marseille. And that seems to be a lesson that the British need, need to know, because the only people that are accorded proper, full panoply of rights in Britain, the people from our empire, are the Falkland Islanders and the Gibraltarians, who happen to be white. Those in the Caribbean, mm. or St. Helena, who are not white, have very few rights comparatively, which seems to be racist and unpleasant and not the legacy of empire, which I think is proper. And I think they should take a leaf from the French and the management of their empire. But I never did. I got onto other things and 
it's just a part of the book which still needs to be written, if you like. So speaking of the legacy of empire, the places you visited are nearly all places that, far from choosing to break away from Britain, consistently chosen to stay. But this is the elephant in the room or the, the imperial line in the room today, the subject of empire. So you preface the 2003 edition of Outposts with some caveats about colonialism and empire. And there's great pressure to condemn the past or to demonize it. But you tried to balance this by reminding us that like others, the British empire was of its time and place and that what it left behind was often positive in these places. Would you still agree with that characterization? Well, I, I would. I mean, I realize I'm on shaky ground nowadays because to say anything positive about the British Empire is, is to some um, anathema. Yes, empires are bad. That, that, that's a given. The idea of one group of people lording it over another, particularly when there's a racial dimension to it, is is monstrous, no matter who's doing it. And it's whether it's the Romans or the Greeks or the people who ran Harv, if Harv existed, it's all wrong. But it strikes me that those who, and I put this rather more succinctly, I think, in the closing chapters of the original version of the book, and which remains in the current edition of the book, the actual mechanics of it, once you get over the, leave the principle behind, but the mechanics of it were very well done. And if you look but almost, I mean, I have colonial handbooks up on the shelves behind me now. You look at any place, you know, Fiji or Tonga or you know, Gilbert and Ellis Islands, and there were always nursing officers and medical officers and scientists and people that were studying, studying the language, making sure that the locally prevalent diseases were snuffed out. There was a sort of an earnest interest in the places and the people and the animals and the fauna and the languages, which other empires didn't, to the same degree, display. I mean, you look at the wealth of scholarship now in London on, for instance, the languages of rural India. You know, yes, we shouldn't have been in India, but while we were there, we recorded thousands of hours of Assamese and um, Bengali poetry and, and left a, an intellectual legacy, a cultural legacy, which has no peer among the other European. You won't find that the Portuguese or the French or the Germans, certainly not the Germans, did that. That was much more about conquest. We conquered, but, and I know there'll, there'll be those that scoff at the idea, we conquered, but once having conquered, then we we cared. We were interested. And that, I think, is a weighs the scale considerably on the side of virtue. Empires are bad, but ours was less bad than many. Some places have done remarkably well post-independence, while others sort of went back to um, the way things were before, corruption or sort of a big man's uh, a big man system. Malta went back to the sort of form of piracy it's always been known for before the British. Uh, why do you think this is? It can't be resource dependency because you know, Canada and Australia – have long been resource exporting countries. Yes, it's a very interesting question. I haven't. I've actually never been to Malta. It's one of those places mm. that I, one of the very few major places that I yearn to go to. And you're right. I mean, you look at what happened to that poor journalist a few years ago who tried to uncover some of the corruption. She was killed horribly. Why? Why it happens? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, there are places in the Caribbean that have declined horribly. I mean, the Bahamas is not exactly a, run by people who are pillars of rectitude. But then the seeds of that bad behavior exist in current parts of the empire. I was pointing to the Cayman Islands. Anguilla, similarly, is not exactly full of... And that, of course, had this weird rebellion, which when you had British policemen being airlifted into Anguilla, that was another bizarre story. Precisely why some have declined, I'm not sure, but I have to think about India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, former you know, very much parts of the British, British Empire. Have they benefited from British rule or have they suffered as a result of British rule? It, it is said by most these days, I think, that we rule the place horribly. People point to the Bengal famine of 1920s or whatever it was, and so it could have been prevented. And of course, the way we 
managed the retreat from empire in 1947 was monstrous and millions were killed. Those who have in India who have affection for the British are declining in number. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I remember vividly meeting an old man up in Murray in the hills in Pakistan. And he used to be a steward on the Viceroy's train. He chose to go to Pakistan once Pakistan was created after the British left in August 1947. And he misses, or I mean, I'm sure he's long dead now, he said, I, I hate Pakistan. He said, I hate what it's become. And that there was a rife with corruption and many years of sort of anarchy and then military rule and coup d'etat and so forth. And he said, sometimes I dream, he said, that the British were still here. And, you know, I listen, I finish my shift on the train and I walk home and the band is playing in the gardens and all the fences are neatly painted and the sand is raked properly and everyone's nice to one another. And I wake up and it's, it's mayhem and Pakistan and it's horrible all over again. I wish the British were back. That, you seldom hear that sentiment today. Most of those people have gone. And the people that are more interested in the principles of the matter rather than the practicalities of the matter, they're, in, as it were, controlled today. I still think that much of Indian administration owes benefit to the British having been there, but I'm in a small minority these days, so I keep quiet. Well, so Outpost is one of your earliest books, and it must be strange to be asked to talk about it so many decades later, so I really appreciate that you're being willing to do so. Um, could you leave us with uh, what you're working on now? What's next? Yes, yeah, so well, I've just done this sort of biggish book on on the history of um, of knowledge, on the, how knowledge is acquired and stored and disseminated. Uh, but I'm just beginning, in fact, signed the contract just a couple of days ago, on the natural history of the wind. Mm. So, oh, yes, uh, you mentioned this. Yeah. I'm looking at uh, wind in all its manifestations, gentle. So I'm interested in breezes and zephyrs and siroccos and so forth, and the poetry and so forth that derives from that. And then working robust winds, so looking at sailing and windmills and generation, you know, wind generation of electricity and so forth, and then terrifying winds, so tornadoes and hurricanes and cyclones and the devastation. And of course, this is the engine that drives the world's weather around the world. I mean, it's both a part of the weather and the driver of the weather. So I'm, I'm looking now over the top of my computer through which I'm talking to you at a row of um, pine trees, and they are all, at the moment, there's no wind at all. But I know that later in the day, the leaves, well, not pine trees, but don't have leaves, but you know what I mean, um, will be fluttering, and I know it's you know, the rain is coming. But, I, it's a wonderfully complex subject, and I, I want to call the book The Breath of the Gods, The Natural History of the Wind, or a BBC producer who's, there's an exquisite little film called In the, In the Face of the Wind. He regards the, the wind as the song of the planet, because it's always sounding, sometimes loudly, sometimes quietly, but the music of the wind is something to listen to. So that's going to occupy me for the next couple of years. Excellent. Well, we look forward to reading this. Thank you very much for your time today, Simon. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for listening to this episode of Personal Landscapes. If you like the podcast, please give it a rating on iTunes and subscribe through your favorite app. You can find links to today's podcast and more conversations on Books About Place at ryanmurdoch.com. You'll also find a donate button if you'd like to contribute to the costs of the show. All donations are greatly appreciated. Thank you.